Israel's prime minister would be arrested if he sets foot in Germany. That is if the International Criminal Court goes ahead with its plan to execute an arrest warrant against Netanyahu for what the ICC prosecutor describes as war crimes. A spokesperson for the German chancellor was asked about it and said the German government, quote, would take Netanyahu into custody because, quote, we abide by the law. The comment came after Israel's ambassador to Berlin asked the German government to reject the ICC's proposed arrest warrant. As always, a lot of developments coming in out of the Middle East, so I do want to talk about those. And let's bring in Paul Salem, the CEO and president of the Middle East Institute. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you, Josh. Good morning. Good morning. Well, first off, want to talk about the situation there in Germany. Is any of that surprising? Is it concerning? And is it possible that other countries there will kind of follow suit? Uh, well, I mean, I think there are two things to the uh, announcement in Germany. One, certainly Germany has a very, uh, you know, specific position towards Israel relating to the history of the Holocaust. It has always been very supportive of Israel, and I would say remains supportive of Israel. Uh, equal more or less to what the U.S. position has been for a long time. But at the same time, uh, Germany and France uh, and the nations of Europe that came out of the ruins of World War I and World War II committed to building a Europe built on the rule of law, on agreements, on treaties, on the European Union. So they have a very profound respect for the rule of law. So I think, you know, this situation... Uh, exemplifies that, a country that's very supportive of Israel, at the same time very supportive of the rule of law, and feeling that it needs to uphold the decisions uh, of courts. I think, you know, we're going through that same struggle in the United States between politics and, uh, and the rule of law. It's a very interesting development. And sticking with Netanyahu, he did say on Wednesday that Spain, Ireland, and Norway's plan to recognize a Palestinian state is akin to handing out, quote, a reward for terrorism. What might be the motivation for these nations there to announce this now and really almost simultaneously? Uh, yeah, certainly it seemed to have been coordinated. Uh, it's a very significant move, particularly to have Norway uh, part of that. Norway was the host of the Oslo Accords, the attempt 30 years ago to forge peace between Israelis and Palestinians and move towards a two-state solution. Since then, the two-state solution has uh, all but been buried. Yes, the Israeli reaction to this has been, um, you know, arguing that this is a reward for what Hamas did on October 7. Uh, but I think uh, the announcement by these three countries, which, by the way, joins 144 other countries, including the Vatican that had already taken that step in the past, so a vast majority of states in the world, uh, reflects an exasperation that... Uh, you know, on the Israeli side as well, there has been no uh, commitment or forward progress towards building the conditions of a two-state solution. And indeed, the mess that Prime Minister Netanyahu finds himself in uh, was partly the result of a long-term strategy which allowed uh, Hamas to be in, uh, be in Gaza, and uh, Netanyahu felt that that was a manageable situation and it will also prevent any pressure uh, for, on him for negotiating towards a two-state solution. Most, I think, states are beginning to recognize that this needs a solution, and the only viable solution uh, is working towards a two-state solution. The fact that it came seven months after the attacks uh, by Hamas on Israeli civilians is unfortunate, but obviously that's not the whole story, and we need to move forward rather than backward. The Israeli war cabinet deciding essentially that that Israeli delegation should go back to uh, kind of negotiating a deal that would re uh, lead to the release of the remaining hostages, more than 100 that are still there in Gaza, more than seven months after the attack by Hamas. So what might be, let's say, the motivation there to continue those talks? And are we any closer to a deal than we were, let's say, a month ago, three months ago? Uh, well, I think Prime Minister Netanyahu is pursuing, uh, you know, two pathways at once, partly responding to domestic uh, pressures as well as international pressures. One is he's continuing to prosecute the war uh, with operations at Rafah. Those operations are more restricted, more targeted, taking more time, 
and that is in response to pressure from the United States uh, not to do an all-out and very destructive assault. At the same time, uh, he's committing to continuing to negotiate, so waging war and negotiating at the same time. I think that, in a sense, we are closer to a resolution, but uh, only after uh, uh, the Israeli military or Netanyahu completes his operations in Rafah and declares at some point uh, uh, some kind of victory or some kind of end to military hostilities. At that point, I think we will be uh, very ready for a more permanent ceasefire, a release of you know, whatever hostages are, are still alive, that's, that's not certain, and release of Palestinians in Israeli, uh, in re Israeli prisons. The IDF saying that it has captured over half of that corridor there that is just under nine miles along the Gaza-Egypt border. What is the significance of that? Because there's been a lot of talk about that corridor, especially over the past, I would say, several weeks. Uh, well, that uh, number of, uh, you know, reasons that's important. One, that was one of the crossings that humanitarian aid was uh, coming in from, uh, and that humanitarian aid has been very, very much below what is desperately needed by a population, half of which is facing uh, famine. Uh, secondly, it is uh, uh, an, a, an area where Israel and Egypt have often coordinated, where there were Egy Egyptian forces as part of a previous agreement, the Israeli move into the Philadelphia corridor or a corridor has angered the Egyptians and created tension in those two countries, which which do have a a peace uh, agreement. Uh, but clearly, uh, the move into the Philadelphia corridor is part of this final stage of the Israeli military campaign. There are four uh, Hamas brigades still in that general Rafah area, and I think the IDF sees this as part of this final. Uh, you know, hopefully it's the final campaign and that there's not more fighting uh, afterward. The U.S. almost seems to have come around to some of the different uh, changes that have been made to the Rafa operation by the IDF and by Israel. What might be the reasoning behind that shift? Because we know that the U.S. has said time and time again they're against the operation. However, some changes were made and now they seem to be kind of moving toward accepting it. Uh, yeah, the U.S., uh, the Biden administration has been caught between two positions, uh, President Biden fully supporting the Israeli war aims of destroying Hamas, which a uh, position he took early on in the conflict, and at the same time, a position uh, to protect civilians, to bring in humanitarian aid, and to conduct the war in as surgical and as, uh, and as civilian protective, if you can use that term, uh, as possible. And I do think that the Israelis... Uh, have taken some of that into account. The operation in Rafah is uh, sort of more targeted, more special ops. They've also given, uh, they've slowed it down uh, uh, so that a large number of civilians, anywhere between 850 maybe to 900 or 950,000, have moved away from that region. They are still obviously in famine conditions, desperate, no shelter, no food, or very little food, no medical care. So it is still. Uh, a man-made humanitarian disaster or humanitarian crime, uh, but the military operations have uh, been altered to such a degree, as you indicated, that the U.S. doesn't seem to be openly objecting to it. I think it also slows down the military operation, which serves, I think, Prime, Minister's Netan Prime Minister Netanyahu's interests, because he knows that he needs to buy time. And the moment this war ends, there will be an investigation about who's responsible for the breaches of security on October 7. He faces corruption charges. Uh, so he's trying to prolong this uh, for his own political uh, reasons and uh, survival reasons. My last question for you here. We know that House Speaker Mike Johnson has said time and time again that he does want to invite Netanyahu to address U.S. Congress. And now, as of yesterday, I believe, he says he's kind of moving forward with that invitation now. Do you think, just based on your experience, your knowledge, that Netanyahu would travel right now of all times over to Congress and address lawmakers? I think it's uh, quite possible, particularly if he feels that Donald Trump is going to win the upcoming election. He might want to situate himself as a sort of a pro-Trump <clears throat> political leader. He was in the past, uh, but he immediately recognized President Biden's election victory in 2020, which upset Donald Trump. 
Uh, don't forget that uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu did address a joint session of Congress back in the day when Obama was negotiating a nuclear agreement with Iran and took you know, a position hostile to the U.S. administration at the time. Uh, it is quite a phenomenon that Israel, uh, which used to be a sort of a bipartisan uh, issue in the United States uh, with wide consensus in both parties, that is profoundly changing. Uh, partly because, as you have seen, uh, particularly young and left members of the Democratic Party have altered their position and are much more sort of defensive of the Palestinian position now, much more critical of Israel, uh, whereas the Republican Party has moved uh, in the other direction. The other phenomenon is that Bibi Netanyahu has, uh, for years now, thrown in his lot really with President Trump, uh, and Israel has become increasingly a partisan issue in the U.S., uh, which is really quite a new development. All right. Paul Salem there, CEO and president of the Middle East Institute. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here. So many developments coming in out of the Middle East as we are uh, nearing that eight-month mark of the war. Is there anything else that you want to add before I let you go? Uh, well, I do think that the overall picture requires a steady U.S. position in support, first of all, of a ceasefire in Gaza as soon as possible, and immediate arrangements uh, for the governance of Gaza uh, and humanitarian relief. This is an enormous uh, man-made famine and, uh, you know, a very de destructive situation, and the U.S. should remain committed uh, to a two-state solution, particularly that the Arab countries and most of the Muslim countries have made it very clear that they want peace and normalization with Israel. That would be a historic gain for Israel, but they also want uh, for the Palestinians to have their national rights with a state that would be uh, normalized in its relations with Israel as well. So a win-win that uh, the region and the world should not pass up. All right, Paul, thank you again for taking the time to join us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Josh.